process of turning this tough shed into my dream workshop. In the previous video, we DIY'd spray foam insulation on the ceiling and bat insulation on the walls. In this video, we will be hanging drywall and mudding. I am not a professional drywaller by any means, especially mudding. There's definitely an art to it and it takes a while to get the hang of it. But if you're trying to save some money or like me finishing off a shed where a few imperfections don't really matter, I definitely recommend trying to DIY it. I've only done a tiny bit of drywall work in the past, mostly patching drywall, so this was definitely a big challenge. I've watched my dad drywall over the years and I've seen tons of tutorials, so I'm breaking everything that I've learned down into this one video. I've also created a drywalling and mudding cheat sheet, which I think is so helpful, especially if this is your first time drywalling or mudding. You can find the link to that PDF in the description below, as well as the tools and materials that we used. Let's start hanging some drywall. First step is ordering materials and gathering the right tools. If you need help calculating the amount of drywall required for your project, Home Depot's website has a drywall calculator tool. You can input your dimensions and it will tell you how much drywall you need and will even factor in 10% extra in case of bad cuts or breaks. We're using half inch drywall, which is most common for walls and ceilings. We ordered all our material through Home Depot and just had everything delivered right to the house, which was definitely the right move. If you're having everything delivered, you might as well throw in the drywall screws, joint compound, taping material, and any additional tools that you may need. We used the very basic beginner tools for this project, which you can find in the description below. Before hanging drywall, some prep work is required. Go around the room to make sure any staples, nails, or screws aren't sticking out of the framing and to ensure no insulation is in the way. If you need to add any additional blocking, now's the time to do it. Make sure your drywall has a place to start and stop on a stud or backing. Lastly, make sure electrical wires and plumbing lines are covered with nail plates where required. Next step is to determine the layout for your drywall. You want to use the largest pieces possible to minimize the amount of seams. Your drywall has to start and stop on a stud, so measure accordingly. If you need to drywall the ceiling, that's where you should start. We're doing tongue and groove on the ceiling, so we're going to install that after the drywall is finished on the walls. Stagger all vertical joints. This helps to improve the strength of your walls. Place any seams over windows and doors in the middle of the opening instead of at the corners to prevent cracking. Leave a half inch gap or so at the floor. You don't want drywall touching the floor to prevent moisture or water damage. A foot lift or spacers can help with this. The two long sides of the drywall are tapered. This beveled edge is an eighth inch thinner than the rest of the drywall. Always place beveled edges next to each other. Whenever possible, place your cut edges against the corners where they'll be covered by trim or another piece of drywall. Typically, it's best to hang the top row first and then the bottom row. Before hanging drywall, mark on the subfloor or on the top plate the locations of each stud. This will help out when you're marking out your nailing or screwing pattern on the drywall. For each wall, snap a chalk line so that you have a level line as a guide to place your first row of drywall. If you're starting at the top, make sure you're accounting for that half inch gap at the floor. Now into cutting drywall. For cutting drywall, we're just using basic tools, a drywall T-square and utility blade. To cut the drywall, take your measurement from a square end, place your drywall T-square edge on the line and use the utility blade to score the front side of the drywall. You're only scoring the front side, you don't need to cut all the way through. Score the front side, snap it, then cut the paper backing. You may want to smooth the rough edges with a rasp to achieve tight joints. Cut overall lengths about a quarter inch shorter for easier fitting. For hanging drywall, you want to align the first row of drywall with your level chalk line. If you're using half inch drywall, secure a few one and a quarter inch drywall screws to hold it in place. There is a power tool called a drywall drill which makes screwing off the drywall faster and easier. However, we opted to use a drill and a drywall bit. This bit ensures you don't overdrive, you don't want to puncture the drywall paper, and this bit sets the screws at the perfect depth. Take your drywall T-square and mark out the center of your studs where the screws need to go. You should have screws on every stud about 12 inches apart and about 8 inches apart around the edges. Hold off on screwing the drywall at the cut edges that meet along the length of the stud until both pieces are hung. This is to prevent any blowout from hindering the positioning of the next piece. The joint of the drywall along the length of the stud is called a butt joint. 
For cutting out around outlets, switches, doors, windows, fixtures, we used a drywall jab saw. If you have a lot of cuts, you may want to consider a rotary cutout tool. Cut the drywall to fit around electrical boxes and fixtures, plumbing rough fins, etc. Determine to the nearest eighth of an inch the horizontal measurements on the wall to the box location. Mark the exact location on the face of the drywall. Using a drywall square or speed square and a pencil, transfer these marks to the face of the drywall. For your vertical dimensions, do not measure up from the floor. Instead, measure down from the bottom of the drywall that you've already hung. Transfer this measurement, measuring from the top down. Double check your measurements, then use the tip of the jab saw to puncture all the way through the drywall and cut out your fixtures. When hanging the bottom row, use a drywall foot lift or blocking to lift your drywall in place. To cut out windows and doors, hang your drywall directly over the window or the door, secure plenty of screws to the framing around the window or door, and then use your saw to cut them out using the window framing or door framing as a guide. We had to add some additional blocking at the gable ends here. We also added some backing for the mini split unit while we were at it. The drywall is finished, now let's move on to the not so fun part, taping and mudding. Check out the cheat sheet below for the link to the basic tools and materials that we used. I had a bin of old drywall tools in the garage from my dad and I'm finally putting them to use. Here I have a mud pan, but you can also use a hawk. I have six inch, eight inch, 10 inch, and 12 inch mudding knives. Here's a mixer for the joint compound, drywall joint tape. This is all purpose joint compound. We used this to embed the tape. This is plus three joint compound for the finish coats and then Easy Sand 90 or Easy Sand 45 for filling any large gaps or holes over a quarter inch. You'll also need a drill for mixing the compound and a bucket of water to keep your tools clean. Before mudding, we need to do a little prep work. Go around and set in any screws that aren't in all the way. Again, a reminder not to drive the screws in too far. If there are any raised bits of drywall at the seams, dent it in so you can fill it with mud. You'll want to plastic your floor because it's about to get very messy. If you're mudding the ceiling or you have tall walls, consider renting a scaffolding. Full disclosure, there are a lot of other great videos out there to demonstrate technique. Mudding is an art and it takes a lot of practice and I don't do this all the time. You can watch all the videos in the world, but nothing is quite like actually throwing mud on the wall and just trying things out until you find what works. You may want to consider pre-cutting some eight foot sections of drywall tape for easier handling. Keep a bucket of water close by so you can clean your tools or hands when needed. You always want to keep any dried mud or dust away from your clean mud, so it's best to clean your tools and your mud bucket as you go. I kept my mixer right 
in the bucket of water so it didn't dry out. Step one, pre-fill any gaps or holes that are larger than a quarter of an inch. If you have any large gaps, it's best to go through and fill those first with a fast drying compound like this Easy Sand 90 or Easy Sand 45. You could use an all-purpose mix, but it's going to take a lot longer for your mud to dry. After you've pre-filled the large gaps and holes with a six inch knife, wait for the mud to dry according to the instructions and then you can move on to the next step. Step two, bedding the tape. There's a lot of different strategies out there as to the order of how to do things. We're going to start with the tapered horizontal joints, inside corners, and finish with butt joints. If we had any outside corners, we would have done them last. Screw indentations are the easiest to fill, which can be done as you work past them. Next, it's time to mix our mud. For this step, I'm using an all-purpose joint compound. As a beginner, I find this works best instead of trying to mix my own compound. For the step of bedding your tape, it's okay for your mud to be a little bit thicker. In fact, I found it easier to work with this way when it's not sliding all over the place. You have to be very careful with the consistency of your mud though. If you start taping and you notice your tape is bubbling or blistering, it's most likely because your mud is too dry, so just keep it an eye out. I'm adding a bit of water to the mud like the instructions say and mixing it thoroughly. I found it easier to mix mud and a little bit of water right in the pan as I go. I added just enough water to see a slight change in the consistency. For this first coat of bedding the tape, I'm using a six inch knife and a mud pan. You could also use a hawk, but I think this is easier and more manageable as a beginner. Let's do the tapered joints first. The tapered joints are where the two long beveled edges of the drywall meet. There's going to be a dip here, so you want to fill the joint with a decent amount of mud. Then go over and spread the mud evenly over the joint. Center your tape over the seam. Gently go over the tape with your knife to set the tape and to scrape out any excess. You don't need to apply a ton of pressure and be sure to keep your knife angled. I found it worked best to go over the tape one more time with another light coat of mud to wet the tape. You want to keep your mud edges nice and clean, so to feather them out, apply pressure to the outside edge of your trowel as you run it along the top and bottom side of the joint. Next are inside corners, which I found to be very tricky. You'll want to pre-cut and pre-crease your tape so it's all ready. With your six inch knife, apply mud to each side of the corner. Spread the mud out a bit and then set your creased tape and gently scrape out any excess. On one side at a time, wet the tape with mud again after it's been set. Just like before, keep the edges of the mud nice and clean by feathering it out. Butt joints are next. Butt joints are the vertical joints that run along a single stud. 
You will want these joints to be as clean as possible with no extra mud. This is because these joints are not beveled. The tape and mud add additional material to the face of the drywall, so we only want to apply a thin coat of mud to set the tape. There is mixed reviews on overlapping your tape. Most say don't overlap because it's adding extra buildup. And then wet the tape one more time with a very light coat on top. When going over the tape, apply a bit more pressure to your knife to wipe out any excess mud. Next are outside corners. Unfortunately and fortunately, I don't have any outside corners to demonstrate with, but these would be taken care of last. For the screw indentations, go over all of these with your 6 inch knife. You don't have to worry about covering the holes that will be covered by baseboard trim or window and door trim. Be sure to scrape away any excess mud. Step 3 is to scrape off bumps and ridges. Make sure you read the dry time on your joint compound. Dry time may vary depending on temperature and humidity. This mud we're using takes about 24 hours to dry completely. Once everything is dry and before starting the next coat, we need to go around and scrape any ridges, bumps, or high spots. Just use a sharp 6 inch or 8 inch knife and go around the whole room to knock down any high spots. If you start scraping and you gouge the mud because it's still soft, you need to wait longer for it to dry. Now that everything is scraped down, we can apply our second coat of mud. I'll be using an 8 inch knife and the plus 3 joint compound. This compound is lighter than the all purpose compound and we're still going to add a tiny bit of water. I like to start on one side of the inside corner, then do the taper joints, the butt joints, screw indentations, and then come back to the other side of the corner. You could also wait until the next day to do the second side of the corner to prevent gouging the wet mud, but I don't have the patience for that. For the second and third coats, we're not using a lot of joint compound. These steps are all about feathering out the joints a few more inches, making sure all your edges stay nice and clean. For butt joints specifically, you don't want to be adding extra mud to the center of the joint. The goal is to feather out each side since the center is already raised with tape with your 8 inch knife, feather it out 8 inches on either side of the joint. For your third coat of mud, follow the same step as before using a longer knife. Once again, the goal is to feather out the previous coat even more. For this coat, we used the same plus three joint compound. Take your 10 inch knife and place it over the mudded joint. If there are still any high spots or low spots, you can apply additional coats as needed. We did one last coat using a 12 inch knife. You do not need to do a 6, 8, 10, 12 inch knife, however, you should always finish with the widest knife that you're comfortable with, like a 12 or 14 inch knife. If you decide to skip a coat of mud, I recommend skipping the 8 or 10 inch coat. Once our tongue and groove was installed on the ceiling, I went back and mudded the top beveled edge to eliminate the gap in between the drywall and tongue and groove board.
After your final coat of mud is dry, you can sand. You can do it close up using the sanding blocks or you can use these pole sanders with different attachments. Run your sanding block or pole sander over all the joints to get a smooth surface with no lines between the edge of the compound and the drywall and with no ridges or pinholes. Be sure to wear protective equipment. This will produce a ridiculous amount of dust, so be safe. Now it's time to get everything cleaned up and we can start priming and painting the walls. There are different levels of drywall finish. If you're doing an unfinished garage or workshop, you could get away with a level one or two finish. We're doing a fancy workshop and our goal was to achieve a level four finish with no texture needed. As a test, you can take your 12 inch knife and place it perpendicular over the joints to see if the mud is level. If your knife rocks, you have too much buildup. I'm gonna be honest, I thought we did a pretty bad job, but after sanding and inspecting everything, I would give us a nine out of 10. We probably added a bit too much mud, which required some extra sanding, but the result is pretty amazing. We don't need to add any extra texture, so I think we easily achieved that level four finish. You've already seen a bit of a sneak peek. Next up, we'll be installing shiplap on the ceiling and installing a mini split system so you can look forward to those projects next. I put so much time and effort into these videos. I'm currently recording this voiceover at two in the morning, so I really, really appreciate you guys watching and subscribing. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next video.